Hello, Anne. Thank you so much for coming to join us on Meet Me in the Mushroom. I'm so honored and grateful for your time. Very, very happy to be asked. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, Kathy. I am very excited to hear your story and to share your story with with the viewers. And so I guess I'll just share a little a little snippet of your background and more will will evolve through the conversation. But um, Anne is a psychotherapist and a somatic therapist and a student of Buddhism. And she is affiliated with Yale University in the United States, which is a very well renowned and respected university. So they're doing some interesting work over there with psilocybin. And we're going to have a little chat about it today, as well as some of the adventures and stories from Anne's own own exploration, I guess, through life. Yeah. So where would you like to start? Where would you like to begin? I mean, one of the reasons I was so excited, besides the whole, you know, the Yale University and understanding what's happening there with the with the clinical research, I'm quite curious about your Buddhist background because you know a lot of the conversation that I'm having on this show is around the psycho-spiritual or the very mystical and the line of of Buddhist tradition and Buddhist thought I think is so intimately linked into the conversation around psychedelic exploration or psychedelic therapy in the sense of that union within self and that sense of the fading away of the sense of separation. So I'd love to just chat to you a little bit about, about your thoughts or your journey and your perceptions on that. Sure. Um, it's a very big topic, <laughs> uh, but maybe I'll just start with my background. Um, so I grew up as a child in Japan and lived there until I was a teenager. Uh, then we moved to the United States. But I always had this split in me that, you know, I felt like half of me was Japanese. And then I had to develop this American personality structure that was sort of separate from that. Um, and those two remained kind of split until I was in college and my parents moved back to Japan for work. And it just so happened that I, uh, on home on vacation from college, got into a very bad car accident. So I was sitting next to the driver and we crashed into um, a bridge. And it shattered my left leg. Um, to the point where I lost a lot of pieces of bone and they thought they might have to amputate the leg. And I was in a wheelchair for six months. And I was 19 years old, very active, and completely um, not equipped to metabolize that kind of change. And I really interpreted what was happening to me in a spiritual sense. So I felt like my whole sense of self and what a self was, was shattered, you know, along with the leg. And I thought that I needed some help in, you know, some spiritual guidance in figuring this out. So that started me on a quest, a very serious one, which ended up in Japan where I made uh, a visit to a Zen Buddhist master and asked to be his student. And during the interview, he asked me to, to say why I was coming to him, and I did. And then he said, well, of course you must solve the problem of life and death. And that was the moment I knew that he was my teacher. And not having ever meditated before, I uh, joined a silent retreat the next morning, and it was a week-long retreat. And I think I spent the entire week crying <laughs> because it was so painful, uh, including physically. And then I got to the end of it, and I thought, this is just great. This is exactly what I've been looking for. 
So I, I graduated from college, and then the day after graduation, I went back to Japan, and I spent、um, seven years there. Was eight years in total as his student, and while I was there, because I already had some language capabilities, I、um, I sort of got my reading and writing up to speed, and I started taking graduate level courses. At a Japanese Buddhist university called Komazawa University in in Tokyo, and、um, while I was there, then I met an American professor from Yale, who invited me to come to the Buddhist studies program at Yale. So I did, and that's how I ended up in New Haven. And since leaving Japan,、um, I've really built my life around Buddhist practice and sangha. And been very involved with, you know, my sangha here in the United States, so that continues.、Uh, so I have a both academic and、uh, practical practice background. Wow! Wow! What a journey!、Yeah. I can't believe you were so young and felt that level of call. It's incredible. I think I might describe it as desperation. <laughs> Yeah.、Um, anyway, so、uh, then I didn't become a Buddhist studies scholar,、um, but I continued my meditation and got very interested in the body. Became a yoga teacher and a yoga therapist, and in my work as a yoga therapist, I was giving people the meditation piece, and it seemed to help them as much as it did me. And then eventually, I became a mindfulness-based stress reduction teacher through the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and I got a half-time job at the Yale Medical School teaching mindfulness, which I did for about eight years.、Um, I just resigned at the end of last year, but I taught a lot of mindfulness. Wow. I mean, I'm gonna come back to some of these and and see how they correlate into some things. But I'd love for you to maybe share a little bit about what you are actually doing at Yale in regards to psilocybin. Yes. So I don't know. About three years ago,、um, a message came through on a an online group that I'm part of. That they were looking for therapists to participate in a psilocybin study, you know, as the therapist, not the participant. And a light bulb just went off in my brain, and I thought, oh, you know, not everybody is going to do intensive meditation practice, and this might be the missing piece that can really help people. And I was so fascinated. So, I. I, I was at a restaurant in New York City, and I just stepped outside and I called the、um, prime, the investigator, the PI, immediately, and said, "You don't know me, but you really need me in your study. <laughs> like you need me to be a therapist." <laughs> so he interviewed me and hired me, and the study that we're doing has a ten-week psychotherapy protocol. So we do psychotherapy with the participants for ten weeks. And in those ten weeks, we have two dosing sessions with the medicine. But because it's an experimental study, they can get either a placebo, a low dose, or a high dose. And they're guaranteed to get the high dose once. But in my experience, although it's apparently random, they never get it twice. And It's a study for people with treatment-resistant depression. So, oftentimes, people who've been struggling for decades with really debilitating depression, and it's been very interesting for me to both guide them in their psilocybin journey, but also to work with what happens when they get a placebo or a low dose. They think they're not getting the medicine. They often have very strong reactions to that. And so,、um, my work as a mindfulness teacher really is helpful in the sense that we work with whatever comes up. 
Well, I mean, you know, I'm very passionate about sort of the, I think everybody in the field is, is passionate about the set and the setting and the preparation and the integration. So hearing about your, your specialization, I guess, with, with mindfulness and somatics and psychotherapy, I mean, it's one of the most perfect combinations for somebody that's going to, to support an individual through, through this level of, of work. Because I, I mean, I personally feel having a transcendental foundation is key to being able to support somebody within that type of space. What's your thoughts on that? I would agree 100%. And also, um, through my own journeys with psychedelics, I've found that my meditation practice is extremely um, relevant, I would say. So both for supporting people and also for journeying oneself. Um, I think the meditation practice creates almost a, a more fluid set, a more flexible set, because through the meditation, you're so, you become so accustomed to the arising of different kinds of states. And you realize that you don't know from moment to moment what's going to arise. So what I've found interestingly is that over long practice, the startle reflex becomes attenuated. It becomes less. Um, and in Japan, in the temples, they use a lot of very startling signal instruments. You know, they'll use wooden clappers and it will be like crack right in the middle of practice to signal something. And people who are new to meditation usually jump two feet off their cushion when they hear the crack. But people who have been doing it for a long time don't startle. Okay. And I think that's because you just get so used to, you know, not knowing what's going to come and being present to whatever it is. So that's one thing. And then so many painful states arise. And really, some of them are quite unbearable. You know, they feel like they're going to kill you. <laughs> and when they don't, um, I think people transform in their capacity to be with and to contain painful emotion, which I think is critical for the psychedelic journey. Because it's not that you know, fear doesn't arise or anger doesn't arise, but you're no longer afraid of the fear. And that I think is so helpful. And also in being a guide, you know, you can be with people and you develop this great tolerance for suffering, you know, in yourself and in others. Um, so some of the people that I've guided in the psilocybin study have had very intense and painful journeys. And I think it's the meditation practice that lets me be with them and know that it's going to pass and that, you know, it'll be okay. Are they blindfolded and headphones within the space? They have that, they, yes, the answer is yes, but they off, they can choose to take off the blindfold and they can choose not to have the headphones on, but we use um, a playlist that was developed I think in London somewhere, mm -hmm. um, and we do have um, eye shades that we use. How do you feel about sharing something from your own experiences with psychedelics? Sure. Um, I don't have a huge amount of experience with psychedelics. It's something that I've done only since I've become a guide, mm -hmm. but I felt it was very important to know what the participants were experiencing. And I was convinced that psychedelics didn't really have anything to add or contribute in way of support to meditation practice. 
And that's also the view of many Dharma teachers. But I have to say, I think I'm changing my mind. And um, a recent ayahuasca experience was, you know, I took, I drank the medicine and the effects were very powerful. So what I've learned with both ayahuasca and psilocybin is that the actual journey to me has nothing in common with meditation. The experience of, you know, perceptual distortions and the things that can come up in your head and, you know, none of those are features of meditation in my experience. But what happened was the experience got stronger and stronger and stronger. And I was not lying down, I was sitting up in meditation, kind of watching all these things happen and sort of feeling like I was navigating them. And then at some point I thought, I can't continue in this witness mode. I just have to let go. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. And I let go in particular into a kind of warm quality that I felt that seemed to be calling my name very softly, but I let go into that. And I had, you know, six hours of this very quiet, deep joyfulness. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that's the similarity is that both meditation and psychedelics are ultimately about surrender and letting go and, um, letting go of the habitual resistance that we have to to life and we do it through in and through our bodies as well you know it's not it's on, on every dimension we let go so i don't know if you know um brian muradescu have you read his book no he's done a lot of research on psychedelic use in um, ancient Greece and early Christianity. Oh, I do. I actually have um, some of his books on the Elysian mystery. He has a, he's done some work yeah. on that. Yes. Yes. He just published a book called The Immortality Key. And in the face page of that book, he has an epigraph that is above the entrance to one of the monasteries on Mount Athos. And it says, if you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. <laughs> and it's very similar to the death poem of a Japanese, 17th century Japanese Zen master. So in the Zen tradition, you write these poems uh, right before you die. They're called your death poem. And it's um, a reflection of the deepest truth that you know that you want to impart on your deathbed. And he wrote a poem that's in very colloquial language. It's kind of rough colloquial language, and it's mm -hmm. ad addressed to young people. And he says, um, hey, hey, youngsters, hey, young people, um, are you really disturbed by the thought of your death? Well, my advice to you is just die now, and then you'll never have to die again. Yeah. Something mm -hmm. like that. It's it's really similar to the epigraph on um, on Saint Paul's Monastery. So I think that's that's it right there. Whether you're using psychedelics or whether you're meditating, you know, it's the surrender. What do you think? I'm in complete agreement with you. It's the level of surrender. And I think with, with time, with all of these processes, it also is cultivating a deep sense of trust. It's almost like you trust completely in the divine plan and whatever the next, whatever it is that's about to come, that you trust completely within the process. and. And, and the more you surrender into things, yeah, it, it, on every level, from the somatic to the mental plane to the spiritual plane, it is the, it is the, the, the golden key, I guess, for, for moving, moving into better, more alignment and 
deeper sense of wholeness and connection and all of those beautiful things that wait on the other side of very difficult experiences. Even, you know, you speak about the, the, the silent meditation retreats like of Apashna, having to sit and surrender into that posturing for so many days and you go through de layerings of death and you know these these concepts that make you more resilient make you stronger bring you greater control of your mind and of your spirit and i think that's the thing with the psychedelic experience it's the the letting go and and for me with my first psychedelic experience i remember that was one of the most challenging things because i I'd, I'd never had to let go to that degree and 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 that's where the resistance and the body and the tension and the mind and the racing and once you find that blissful like ah, then everything just shifts yeah so i'm in complete agreement with you there mm -hmm. and you can't leave the body out of it it's 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 essential it's absolutely essential so for you, when you're, you know, working with people in the integration window after they've had this this type of experience, whatever it may be for them within the within the psilocybin space, is there somatic elements that are coming in? Yes, um, the somatic elements are really strong during the journey. I work a lot somatically with people to help them get through, you know, rough patches in the journey. And, um, but yes, somatic elements come in. Um, I work a lot somatically, you know, just in general in psychotherapy. So, um, for example, with painful emotions, you know, they tend to trigger rumination. But if you can identify them as sensations and track them and work with them, uh, that can be very, very helpful in helping you to accept and explore the emotion without getting caught in runaway rumination about it. Um, so yes, I, I would say that we definitely work somatically and psychotherapeutically in the integration but it's really i think the main place where i wish for more time and space to do meditation with people because my um, experience is that they have this great journey and this amazing experience and then about a week later or less it shuts down and the neural patterns that have been there for decades reassert themselves. Mm. And those neural patterns don't change quickly. They take a long time and they change slowly and imperceptibly. And they don't have a tool to help them, you know, because they can't just go out and get another psychedelic. Uh, so I think that the integration is where different forms of meditation, you know, not just mindfulness, but including metta practices and self-compassion practices, I think can be so helpful because they, they provide people with something that is, you know, that they can use to support themselves. It, there's, I think yeah. the, the meditation piece is, is going to be a key component of some kind of integrated um, system of healing. Yeah, for me, I mean, when I, I'm, I'm very curious that it's a, a 10 week program that you are operating over there with at, at Yale, because I am think a lot of people who are maybe not on a clinical scale, to extreme of a clinical scale, but I guess there are people with, with, with all sorts of spiritual emergency that are traveling to Peru or they're traveling to the Netherlands and they're partaking in ayahuasca or psilocybin, whatever the, the, the medicine is. But to understand the level of work that needs to go in to prepare yourself and then to integrate the experience so that you can 
really see the benefit of it. And I think that's a sort of information that needs to become more mainstream and more spoken about. When I work with people, it's usually six months of, of, of work. You know, there's intensive preparation and I work a lot with breath work because I find breath work is a really good modality holotropic breath work or conscious connected cyclic breathing because you're you're simulating a space where you need to let go and you need to surrender and there's somatic elements and there's a mental space and working a person through a rotation of breath immersions and meditative immersions sort of helps to prepare them for the space and then how do you help them to integrate that into the their their day-to-day -day afterwards so I love that it's 10 weeks and I'm curious, how frequent are the the non-medicine spaces, so the psychotherapeutic spaces over the 10 weeks? They're mostly every week until the last quarter and then sometimes you skip a week, but mostly they're every week. Um, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on integration. You've been, you know, doing this work very intensively, um, mm -hmm. much more than I have in this, you know, in this study. Mm -hmm. And I would love to hear your thoughts about what, what you need for really good integration. There's a few things. It's dependent on the individual. Like I work with some people who I haven't worked with in medicine who come to me who've had very difficult experiences in medicine and they're struggling to implant medicine spaces and they're struggling to reintegrate into normal life. And I, I mean, I see this quite a lot. People who have spiritual emergency from psychedelic medicine spaces, from ayahuasca ceremonies or um, working with um, psilocybin and it opens them up too much perhaps they weren't suitable I think for for maybe working with these types of medicines in the first place so even before integration I think a big thing is screening and you know this is why obviously in a clinical setting this is very very different because they're rigorous around screening and checking for a whole host of of um Key, key elements, I guess, that might say somebody is a high risk for that type of space. And so, you know, the merging of the conversation of psychotherapeutic clinical spaces and then more shamanistic type spaces, which are also accessible to people, but both spaces almost need to learn from each other, I think. So screening. And then if I get someone who has um, opened up almost too much, then I will work with them with a lot of grounding techniques so they need a lot of time in nature you know walking with trees things that are going to get them very back into the physical nothing that's going to expand them further out i work with a lot of uh, information that would be used for kundalini awakening so if somebody has gone through quite an intensive kundalini awakening in an ashram in india they're going to put them to work on the land. They're not going to send them into the ashram to keep working through these transcendental experiences. So I find getting out in nature, doing some sort of transpersonal coaching work in a nature setting, working with a lot of grounding, working with particular foods, like understanding what you need to eat just to help you come back to the body and that kind of dialogue for someone who is still very, very expanded. And then for other people who have, you know, are, are just going through their process, I honestly, I say no other psychedelic medicines for a minimum of six months. Really, you need 12 months to to integrate this level of experience, because I think there's a big rush. It's like people think this is it. This is what's going to work. I'm going to do psilocybin. I'm going to do ayahuasca. And there's this sort of moving around, but they're not integrating the experience and now obviously there's um exceptions maybe some people would be on a, a rotation of three months in three months you go through another experience or in six months but i think taking the time and that's a big conversation i have with people slow down let's integrate this let's see how we can work through incorporating it into your day-to-day -day. meditation is key developing more mindful awareness, 
working with breath work again just to if there's any excess things that need to be sort of integrated or released from the physical body working with somatics and those are sort of the key elements so I think really you need a bit of a six month three to six months of an integration window Mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense to me yeah yeah it's it's very time consuming like all traditional healing modalities yeah I think that's also, you know, in Western, the Western world, we are very quick and we expect to get from A to Z in a very short time. And I know, and of course, for people who are coming with atypical depression and they've been searching for supports their whole life, but it's almost like having to reintroduce this conversation of slowing down surrendering into the process and developing a practice yoga i think is a very central pillar it's something that i'm very passionate about you have to understand you have to have a body practice i i concur completely yeah you have to because i do think that healing everything happens in and through the body you know, our body is not separate from anything. Mm. Meditation happens in and through the body. Yeah. What would you say in terms of, I mean, your your yogic discipline, what field of yoga did you study? Um, I studied several fields, um, but my absolute favorite and the one that I used as a teacher was Anusara yoga. Um, it's kind of tantric. It's a combination of tantric based and um, Iyengar alignment. Um, mm. And uh, it's really lovely. And when you teach a class, you always have a heart theme. So you mm. teach thematically. Um, it's just, it was a beautiful, beautiful style of yoga. And unfortunately, the founder of it, um, sort of the, the whole structure and organization imploded, but <laughs> which was too bad, but it really was a beautiful style. But I also um, have certificates and, you know, various other styles, but that was always my favorite because of the heart piece and also the really fine attention to both alignment, careful alignment, but also um, what they call action. So they make this distinction between, you know, how your body parts line up, but then the movements of energy, you know, both uh, drawing in and extending out. Wow. Wow. And your thoughts on people that say psychedelics are a spiritual bypassing? Have you any perceptions on that? Yeah, um, I would say for most of my life, I probably was in that camp. <laughs> um I just really take the attitude now of not knowing, you know, I don't think that, um, that I know very much, <laughs> but my mind has really been opened to the possibility that uh, while I find the experiences are very different, as we said, that, that the common factor is that both are about ultimately about surrender. And I think psychedelics are almost, you know, an imposed surrender in a way. And you can resist it in the middle of the journey, but your journey probably won't be very, you know, pleasant <laughs> if you resist it. So it's an imposed surrender. And I think meditation works differently. It's it's setting up the conditions and then surrender can happen spontaneously, but it's not something that you make happen. So I really don't think anymore that it's spiritual bypassing. I do think that they can work synergistically. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm sort of just beginning to think about how that might, what that might look like. Yeah, it, it makes me happy because, of course, with, you know, the level of, of experience and exposure 
to to all of these teachings and to now be merging and exploring them at this at this level and I think it's so beautiful because we're we're coming back to nature in a different way now in a very modern way but also bringing the philosophies and the teachings and understanding how they can complement each other to really help people and this is ultimately what this is all about we're trying to figure out ways of we have a massively damaged society now and not everybody can can access these teachings or even cognitively process them so what is nature trying to tell us of how she can assist us to to heal and how can we take take these teachings and merge it into this really beautiful new way of of assisting so i think it's amazing that this study is happening that they have you and that you're bringing these these qualities into the space and with that in mind, what would you and your, I mean, people you're being exposed to now, what would you say are the key qualities a, a space holder or a psychotherapist would require in moving into this type of field? I think the biggest is the capacity to be in the presence of suffering. Um, I think you need an almost unlimited capacity for that. <laughs> And I think that's true for psychotherapy as well, because when what's happening in front of you uh, feels no longer tolerable, you know, you're, you're too worried for the person and what they're experiencing, then, you know, unconsciously people cut it off, you know, whether they're therapists or their guides or whatever. So that seems to me, number one, is that you have to be... Um, all you have to be okay with any state of mind and trust that through your own experience that states of mind are not inherently uh, damaging or you know even if they're painful they're, they're part of life and part of being a human being and they're transitory they don't last forever, but to be a human being is really to know both incredible joy and love and also incredible suffering. Um, it's so, the scale and the, the, the width of it is so vast. So I think that you need to know all of that. And then I think you need to be very good at paying attention so close attention how are they breathing what is their body doing you know just really moment to moment kind of tracking on every dimension of the person and then there's a sort of intuitive quality that i don't even know how to explain <laughs> but i've seen it again and again sort of you know, you make these decisions like when do you touch a person? When do you put your hand on them? When do you just step back and let them go? All of that is so intuitive. And I don't know how exactly we develop that capacity, except maybe through experience and our own work. You know, you get a sort of sensitivity to things that can't be explained or um, so those are three things that occur to me. Um, do you, would you have anything to add to that? No, I, everything, everything that you said is exactly where I think there was a big mirror for me within your, your perception. And it's that, that presencing and allowing and the space being so safe that whatever it is, whatever it is that comes up or has to come up that it's okay and that they feel that and sense that and there's that energetic agreement and i think breath is critical you know measuring watching being able to assist somebody just to shift ever so slightly breath posturing positioning whatever it is just gentle touch those i think are some of the essential keys to being able to just gently navigate somebody 
within the space. Yeah, it's interesting. The last journey that I guided um, was so intense that I ended up kind of wrapping my arms around the person and putting my cheek on their forehead and they were grasping my fingers and we were that way for like a long time and it was very very intimate yeah but um they needed that kind of grounding touch because the experience that they were having was so shattering in a way it was like huge amounts of stuff just coming up um but you know i i wouldn't do that with you know, just unless it, it felt like the situation called for it. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. And and often, you know, when I work with people, I always ask them, do I have your permission to to put my hands in you? And I, I get familiar with that tactileness because I think it's imp very important. What makes me really happy is that everything you're describing about how you're working within this space it doesn't draw up any of the sterile kind of cold images I think some people get from where the psychotherapeutic model of, of psilocybin work is going, that there is still this warmth and this engagement. And I mean, for you, would you say that you can feel the spiritual dimension present, even though it's in a, a psychotherapeutic or a clinical setting? Do you feel spirit there? Absolutely. I, I think for me, spirituality is always central. You know, I, I, I see everything else as peripheral. <laughs> you know, it's all connected to the center. Um, and so it, it does. I, I hear your um, concern. And I have the same concern, especially since I really agree with you that these processes take a long time. Integration takes a long time. Preparation takes a long time. How I'm worried about, you know, as uh, psychedelics become part of commercial ventures, psychedelic therapy, that the f sort of force and weight and influence of this idea that you can't spend too much money and it has to be quick and you know it has to be evidence-based and you know all those things that um that interfere with really deep healing mm -hmm. i i'm i'm worried about that i have to say and I, I think, you know, this is why conversation is, is so critical because a lot of people are doing really good work just even in becoming psychedelic integration supports. And I think that's important for people to know. Maybe you're accessing, you know, a one day experience or whatever it is. It's a short you're going to go and you're going to access the, you know, whether it's psilocybin or ayahuasca, that there are people out there that can help support you in the background, they can support you in the preparation, they can support you in the integration and really go online, do your research, find spaces, even, you know, this launching of awake.net, I think is so beautiful because it's weaving together now a lot more supports and there are many people like you, like me around the world who can work online with individuals to help them in the processing of, of this experience and to help, I guess, guide people in the right direction as well into who's reputable, is this, you know, right and what spaces are going to be supportive and, and ethical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully <clears throat> that will inform people and, and carry things and the, you know, the, the profit motive <laughs> won't <laughs> um, become, you know, too distorting. Yeah. Well, I live in a time of great exploration, but also great distortion. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting time to be navigating this field. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's so wonderful. 
that this type of therapy is becoming available and that there's research happening and that it's being understood on, on the neurological level. What kind of outcomes are you seeing? It depends on the participant. So, and also because I'm not a scientist mm -hmm. on the team, um, mm -hmm. I don't see uh, what happens, you know, six months and a year later when they do the EEGs of people's brain. I'm not sure exactly what they're finding. So I only know within the 10 weeks, mm -hmm. but I've seen um, everything from you know, people who say, wow, you know, this has absolutely transformed my life. Uh, I experienced four hours of complete relief and I feel like a different person now. Wow. Um, to, I had one participant who dropped out of the study and uh, got electroshock therapy because she wasn't doing well. Um, the majority of the people, I would say, feel like they've been very helped okay. by being in the study, but um, to different degrees. And I think part of that is because we don't do enough in the study. And I think the PIs would agree, you know, one dose of psilocybin is not enough. And it needs to be a longer uh, protocol, it needs to, the psychotherapy needs to be longer. There needs to be more than just one uh, medicine journey. Um, and that the problem, what I've really come to understand is that research is not therapy. <laughs> research is research for the purpose of gathering data. Therapy is for the purpose of healing and helping somebody heal. And they're, they're really, they have two separate agendas. Which doesn't mean, you know, all the, all the scientists I know working with these drugs are extremely loving, caring people who would, I think, also feel that it's unfortunate that it can't, we can't then channel people into some kind of uh, therapy, which is all underground now, as you know. Yeah. Do you think in time when, I mean, when is the big question, but if, if in the United States it becomes accessible to, to work in this capacity, would you feel that this would be something you'd, you'd want to do? I would very strongly feel that way. Um, I'm really interested in developing a kind of comprehensive healing modality that um, works at the intersection of psychedelics, psychotherapy, and sort of contemplative practice, somatic practice, you know, that kind of thing. I think that's the trifecta of healing. And I would love to develop programming or, you know, something to, to, to be part of a group of people thinking about how to integrate all these things. That would be very exciting to me. Let's hope. I mean, I think we're at the precipice, so. They just had an article in today's New York Times uh, front page article um, saying that they think that MDMA and psilocybin will be FDA approved in 2023. So that's not far away. That is not far away. That is not far away. I mean, when I started this journey almost 10 years ago, I was hoping for within five years and now it's been almost 10 and it doesn't feel like that long. So, I mean, it will be, will be very joyous when, when that day finally, finally comes and it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anne. It's really, really fun and lovely to talk to you. Yes, I'm so grateful and really happy that we've connected and really happy that we could share this type of, of dialogue. So thank you. And good luck with everything and with the study and all of the work that you're doing. Thank you very much.